Good evening, and thank you for joining the Westerly Library in Wilcox Park for tonight's author talk. This program is being presented using the webinar version of Zoom, and attendees are joining in listening mode only. Please send any questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to answer them within the time we have allotted. Please note that this program is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel at a later date. Should you get disconnected, simply use the link that was emailed to you earlier to get back into the program. I will now turn it over to our moderator for tonight, a member of the board of the Friends of the Library, Mary Weiss. Thank you very much, Amanda. Good evening and welcome to everyone. This is our virtual author talk, perhaps the last for the season. So you're lucky to be here tonight because we won't have a few for a while. We're very fortunate to have with us this evening, Juliet Fay a best-selling author who has written six books of fiction in different genres since 2008. She is well known to our local audiences living nearby in Massachusetts. My name is Mary Weiss. I'm a member of the board of the Friends of the Westry Library in Wilcox Park. The Friends are collaborating with the library and bringing you this virtual e event this evening. Good evening, Juliet. Good evening. Thank you so much for, for hosting me, Mary, and for being the interviewer. Well, thank you for being with us too. Just a little personal background. I first met Julia in 2016 at an author event sponsored by Bank Square Books in Mystic, Connecticut, when she discussed her recently released fourth book, The Tumbling Turner Sisters. And I have to hold this cover up for everyone, if you can see it. It was really quite a dramatic cover. And I recommend yeah. this to your audiences as well. I hadn't yet read the book, but soon did, and her next book, Sittery of Flickering Lights, which I would regard as a sequel. Would you, Juliet? Um, they're both, they're standalone, but one does follow the other. You don't have to read them in order, but um, one does follow the other, yeah. There's certainly some uh, common characters to both of them. Both are works of historical fiction. Now Juliet's sixth book, which we're going to be discussing tonight, Catch Us When We Fall, was just released in paperback on September 21st, 2021. My first question to you, Julia, is you are an adult fiction writer who has successfully written in several different genres of fiction, romance, mm -hmm. historical, and psychological fiction. How would you classify your latest book that we're talking about tonight? Is it a particular genre? Is it a combination of genre? Or is it a unique genre? Well, I would say that um... I, I can't say I've written in romance. romance. Romance is a very specific kind of genre where the main storyline is about the romance. And so I, I can't say any of my books are, are technically romance. I would say that um, I've heard them called book group fiction or family drama. Um, and I would say that the, the uh, Catch Us When We Fall is sort of falls in that category. Um, it's, um, it is family drama in some ways. Um, it's sort of about the beginning of a family. I'm going to pull, pull this up again on the screen, so hopefully our audience can see this. The cover to Catch Us When We Fall depicts a woman draped in a flowing yellow cape, standing on a beach next to water and below a daylight sky with darker hues. Now, was this a custom cover created for your book or a stock photo adapted for the book? Um, so most covers are stock photos uh, of the vast majority of them are stock photos. It's much cheaper to buy something off of, you know, a stock and there's a million beautiful stock photo covers. Um, so no, it was not, um, it was not sort of done specifically for the book. In fact, when I first saw that cover, I really liked it. I just thought it was a, it was beautiful. It had this sort of wonderful vibe of like, you know, this woman who's really facing, you know, some, some, the wind is blowing and the, the clouds are sort of roiling, but, you know, at the horizon, there's a little bit of pink. And so there's some, there's some hope there too. Um, and that is a consistent with the story that it's a, a woman facing a, a sort of a tough time. Um, but I, I sort of was laughing a little bit because that scene never happened in the book. There's no point at which Cass, the main character is at the ocean She's not wearing a yellow cape or some people said it's a parachute or maybe it's a blanket or a slicker. I'm not really sure what it is. 
Um, she that none of she she's never by a body of, the, of water, and it's really sort of the the cover is really a vibe. It's it's a it's a wonderful vibe. It's a very eye catching co co cover, but it's not this it's not specifically a scene in the book. Um, Certainly caught so, my eye. The coloration yeah. alone is is quite beautiful. It's lovely, yeah. Now I have another question. It's a little odd, but something I always am intrigued by. Your choice of chapter headings. Some authors simply use numbers, one, two, three, four, whatever. Others use character names or places. But for this book, you've called your chapters articles and they're <laughs> numbered sequentially with Roman numerals. Yeah. Does that have any significance? Yeah, the significance is that they forgot to switch that out to say chapter and <laughs> that was not me. Okay. They, it, it's like a formatting thing that they do. And before they made the, you have an advanced reader copy. Oh. Um, so when people buy the book, they will see chapter one, chapter two. Oh, okay. So no, it was not, um, well, it was I must not a choice I, I made. I was just as surprised as you were, Mary. I was like, what's this? You know, so. I was doing all kind of research trying to figure out authors who use Roman numerals with articles. No. And I came up with nothing. So yeah, it really it, enlightened it's just me there. about the design, designing the interior of the book. I don't know. I mean, I just thought it was like, hey, this isn't going to be look like this in the real book, right? The finished copies are going to say chapter. And they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so for those of you who uh, read the book or, or buy the book now, you'll see it says chapters, not articles. Um, I don't want to give any way any spoilers about your book. But you realistically present many emotionally complex characters and relationships in the context of alcoholism. Mm -hmm. However, you state quite unequivocally in your author's note at the end of the book that, quote, the story is not meant to be a comprehensive review of alcoholism, nor to represent the entire gamut of the experience. Why did you choose the context of alcoholism to present this story? Um, so I think I should tell a little bit about the story. So, so sure. listeners, um, can know what the story is about. Um, it's the story of Cass Macklin. She's 29 years old and she's had a little bit of a rough childhood. Um, she's really alone in the world. And at 18, she meets Ben McGreevy and they fall in love and, and, you know, they, they both have some, you know, baggage they're dealing with and they find themselves sort of partying a lot through their twenties. And that really escalates to the point where they both become really pretty serious alcoholics and they're broke and they're having trouble holding down jobs. And it's, it's really pretty messy. Um, the beginning of the book, on page one of the book, Ben has just died. He has died of alcohol poisoning. And uh, Cass and his brother Scott are the only two mourners at the gra graveside service. And Cass is drunk and her brother, you know, the brother, Scott McGreevy is, is really furious. Cass very quickly finds out that she's pregnant. And this is a big moment for her. You know, she's tried to quit drinking before, but never really was able to make it stick. And she knows she's got a big problem. She knows she's got to get sober. if She wants to keep and raise this baby. Um, the problem is she doesn't really have any resources. She's broke. She doesn't really have any sober friends. The only person that she thinks that she can turn to is Ben's brother, Scott, um, who is the third baseman for the Boston Red Sox. And Scott's not terribly interested in, in, in helping her. He's very wary um, because he has spent the last few years sort of cleaning up his brother's and Cass's alcohol-fueled messes. And so he's very wary of her and he kind of wants nothing to do with her. And she's not really crazy about him either. But they are both invested in trying to bring this baby safely into the world. And so they agree to work together. Um, the, the one caveat he, he states very clearly is as soon as she drinks, she's out. So that's the premise of the story. Um, and so the book is about Cass's attempt at recovery. Um, alcoholism has, has played a pretty important role in my life. Um, I have friends and family members who are uh, struggle with the disease, most of whom are in recovery happily. Um, but my dad uh, was, uh, he's, he's in recovery. He's been in recovery for 30 years, but he's drinking the entire time that I, I grew up, which was not always wonderful. Um, 
as much as his drinking affected me as a kid, his recovery really affected me too. Um, it was it was very much like sort of watching somebody come out of a fog, and it was it was really kind of a remarkable process, and I became very interested in it. So I I think I always knew that I I would write a book in which alcoholism was addressed. Um, you know, I had a few fits and starts with it. I really wanted to get it right, uh, but um, I, I I always knew that I would have an alcoholic character, and the reason um, that I put that caveat in there is because. You know, one of the lines in the book, Cass explains to somebody, alcohol, al alcoholics come in a variety pack, all different flavors. And, and that's true. I mean, there's so many people, you know, who struggle with addiction and their stories are all different. I mean, there's, there's certainly some similar themes, but I didn't want people to, to read this and think, oh, this is, you know, this is the experience. You know, there's many, 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 there's as many different experiences as there are alcoholics. Um, well, you certainly present a variety of those experiences in your book. Before we focus on Cass Macklin and Scott McGreevy, the main characters in your book, could we take at some other look at some other characters and what they bring to the story? One character that is very much present, I think, but never heard from directly is Scott's older brother, Ben who you mentioned died of alcohol poisoning and is the father of Cass's child. We only know him through the perspectives, I believe, of Scott and Cass. Why did you choose to make Ben a silent character and draw him out through others? Well, I, um, I wanted to put Cass in a position of really being at, at, a, at a decision point. She wasn't gonna have Ben to turn to. She wasn't gonna have anybody to turn to she was going to have to make this decision on her own. And, um, and I think that alcohol, dying of alcohol poisoning is a realistic thing to have happen mm -hmm. for one of, the, one of the alcoholic characters in the book. It's, it's, it's not completely uncommon, unfortunately. Um, so he, he is one um, description, one sort of representation of the way that alcohol can affect us. Well, it's interesting because he's so important, so significant to Ben and Cass. How is, excuse me, to Cass and Scott, his older, his younger brother, how is he significant for Scott, the brother? Well, I think Scott and, and Ben are the only two children in a family that's pretty uh, dysfunctional. Um, their, their father is very abusive and their mother's pretty narcissistic. And they really cling to each other growing up. Um, they're very close. But the more that Ben sinks into alcoholism, the more Scotty loses him. And Scotty is trying to figure out how to stay in, in Ben's life. And yet Ben makes it very hard. And that's, not, that's not, not an uncommon theme in families where someone's dealing with alcoholism. Um, and Scotty has his own baggage. You know, Scotty, at one point, um, Cass sort of remarks to herself that baseball is Scott's drug of choice. That's how he sort of avoids dealing with some of the things that he needs to deal with. So I think it's true that many of us have ways we cope and some of them are more functional and some of them are not so functional. Well, now we also realize that Ben is very central to Cass's life, but in a very different direction, different way than Scott is. What is that dependence she has on him? Well, you know, she became her, you know, she was the daughter of a, a single mom who died when Cass was in her teens. And so Cass went into the foster care system and she's really alone in the world. And Ben sort of throws her a life preserver. He, he's a very loving guy. He's a good guy. He's very smart. She, she thinks the world of him. And yet he's, you know, got this disease of alcoholism and she sort of follows him into it. Um, and so one of the struggles Cass has is to sort of develop a clear picture of who he was because when she was drinking, you know, her vision was not clear. And, that, and I think that's true. There's, there's a sort of veil over um, the thinking of somebody who's, who's drinking all the time. And so it's in retrospect that she has to look back and say, um, I, gosh, I love this guy so much, but he wasn't always so good for me. 
But wasn't Ben so smart that he was like a big winner in some TV game show or something? You threw that in yeah, there. Yeah, he won. He yeah he he was on Jeopardy, and um and he and he came home with some winnings, which they blew immediately because that was you know sort of what they did. You know, that, now we've talked a lot about Ben. There are other characters in the book that we don't really hear that much or don't hear from directly at all. These are Scott's parents, particularly his mother, Gilda, and Cass's mother. I think you've touched upon that. Maybe you could have a little bit further of the importance of these mothers in the lives of their children. Sure. Um, so Cass's mother is also, was also an alcoholic. Um, and she doesn't die of the disease, but she's, you know, she, Cass grows up with someone who is actively drinking, you know, too much. And, and so Cass has this, um, and she says, my mother was a good mother. My mother was a good mother. Um, and she misses her mother terribly, but she also knows that her mother was struggling with the disease and she does not want to be in that same position as a single mom of trying to raise a child and also, um, being not being sober so, so this sort of teaches um Cass hey if I'm going to be a mom I can't be an alcoholic too because I've lived through that experience and that wasn't what I want is that correct yeah, yeah. I think you know Cass isn't she you know she's not um she, she's not thinking poorly of her mom but she knows she knows what it's like to be raised by somebody who's not 100% there because they're they're in this fog of alcoholism and that's not what she wants at all. Now, just the opposite, we have Gilda, who is present yeah. in Ben and Scott's lives. But yeah. that presence isn't the best, as I understand. She's pretty awful. She's a pretty awful human. Um, she's, you know, I would say she's a, she's a pretty classic narcissist. And, you know, Scotty has built a world where people can't get to him. He's, he's, he is all about baseball, and that's what he does. And, you know, he, so he's, he's built up a lot of walls. Gilda can get to him, you know, and so he's, um, he has purchased, bought her a condo, because of course, he's come into a lot of money now that he's a baseball player, and she wants to be in Florida, he buys her a condo in Hawaii, so she's not, she's a little further away, so, yeah. About as far away as he can get her in the United States. That's right. Um, just to digress for a minute, although alcoholism is a setting of your book, there seems to be another less dominant, but no less important element of parental abuse. This was particularly evident, not only in uh, Scott's life, but in Andrew, also known as Drew Kessler, uh, that's Cass and Scott's teenage neighbor, who is the son of an alcoholic mother and a mostly authoritative absent father. And Drew is responsible really for raising his three little brothers. You, this is a phrase that I keep remembering from your book. You describe Drew as being weary of being wary. That's a real tongue twister, but I think yeah. I got it out. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by that phrase? Well, I think there's a wariness that you feel as a child with, um, with parents that you can't always rely on. And, you know, you're, you, you want to be able to rely on them. You want them and, and, you know, and I think Drew's parents, Drew's parents really love him. You know, it's not like those, it's not like being an alcoholic means you can't love somebody. Of course you can. And his father is trying very much to sort of do the provider thing. So his parents love him. Um, but, but they're not there for him in the way that he needs them to be. And so he's wary of, of, um, of relying on them and of expecting them to show up for him in the ways that he needs them to. And he does do a lot of caretaking of his younger brothers. Um, and that experience is exhausting for him, constantly being on alert, on edge, waiting to see when the other shoe is gonna drop. Um, so I, you know, I think that one of the things that I really um, tried to do with catch us when we fall. And I spent a lot of time talking to people who have experienced the disease themselves is get inside the skin of what it feels like to be somebody who's struggling with this disease. What does it feel like? What does it, what, you know, what goes through your mind? How does it, you know, how does it affect you? Um, and I think that Laurel, his mother is actually a pretty, um, is a character that you root for. She's, 
she's, you know, she's not a bad mom. She's just somebody who's dealing with this uh, and she loves her children very much. She's somebody who's dealing with a disease that is taking her away from being there in the way that she wants to be there for them. Well, it's interesting you mentioned Laurel because there are two women that I believe are integral to Cass's struggle with alcoholism. They are Laura Kessler, Drew's mom, and Kay Kelly. These could, women, however, couldn't be more different from one another. Yeah. Although yeah. they're both alcoholics, Laurel is a fluent suburban mother, and Kate is a single woman who can't hold a job as a dog groomer. Yeah. What do each of those women represent and how are they important to Cass? Well, I think these are her two closest friends, these, these two close women friends, and they're very different from her. Um, but they both, they all three share this struggle and they go to AE meetings together and they try to be there for each other. Um, and that's really what AA is about. AA is a community of people sharing their struggles, their hopes, their dreams. Um, and, and it's really in that community that they're able to sort of get a toehold into sobriety. And it's really, it's really, I would say one of the themes of the book is that it's, it's really in community that we find the help we need. Um, that reaching out, trying, trying to, you know, sort of muddle along um, with your problems alone is a much harder road to, to hoe. And it's, and it's sometimes not, you know, those isn't gonna work. Um, and, the t and the three of them find this community in AA that really helps them to progress. Um, and Scotty, who's also got some stuff, uh, not alcoholism. Um, he's trying to kind of go it alone. Um, and so it's one of the struggles that he has with Kath that he doesn't want to connect too much. He's, that's not something that's comfortable for him. Well, he's wary also. Um, he is. Now we get to the main characters, I think, of the book. There's been so many. I hope we haven't confused our audience with all these different characters, but it's what you're talking about, uh, the different persons who can be afflicted with alcoholism and how amongst them they are so different, but yet they share this common issue. Um, these two characters, Cass and Scott, they each have many relationships that shape who they are and who they become. But the most important one is between the two of them. You have presented Cass so realistically, incredibly. Is she someone you know, or is she based upon a combination of people you know? It just feels like you know this woman so well. Oh, well, that's really the highest praise you can give me, Mary. Thank you so much. I do feel like I know her. I feel like she's real. I mean, I always joke about my imaginary friends are the, the characters in my books, and I feel like I know them, and I worry about them, and I'm, you know, <laughs> I want them to be okay. But I also have to throw a whole lot of conflict at them, because that's my job, too. Um, she's not based on a single person. She's really in some ways, a compilation of, of things that I've learned, things that I've read, people I've talked to, um, things I learned from going to AA meetings and, and hearing what people there said, um, of really trying to sort of get, get that, like I said, get in that, inside that skin, um, not only of an alcoholic, but of a young, a 29 year old who finds herself surprisingly pregnant and with no help. So, I mean, Alcoholism is sort of the main theme of the book, but there's other things Cass is dealing with too, um, not the least of which is uh, being a single mom. Well, it looks like then she didn't develop like overnight, like you got up in the morning and said, ah, I know this character, but that she grew upon you and she developed as you developed, as you wrote your story. Would that be an accurate? Well, you know, it's so funny statement. that you put it that way, Mary, because um, honestly, I did wake up one morning with her in my head and I didn't know who she was. I, I woke up one morning, I was working on another project and I woke up one morning and, you know, sort of at the edge of a dream and it's this sort of image came to me of two people at two mourners at a grade side service and the woman is drunk and the man is furious. And I, you know, normal people get up and go about their day. <laughs> But writers will sit there and go like, wait, who's that? What do we do? What's happening here? And, and what if this person, you know, so I sort of lay there for a while, sort of thinking about, you know, why is she so drunk? And why is he so angry? And what, what who are they to each other? And who's in the box? And, you know, um, so I, I was thinking about them, but then I eventually did get up and I went back to my, you know, I sort of was like, okay, don't get distracted. You're working on this other project, you know? And, but I couldn't stop thinking about them. And I, so my strategy was, 
I'm going to write one chapter about these two people who I very quickly named Cass and Scott. Um, and then I'm going to go back to my real work. Um, so I thought one chapter will sort of clear the decks, get them out of my head. I, maybe I'll come back to it at some point. Maybe I won't. Um, but that really backfired because the more I wrote about them, the more interested I became in them. And my process when I write a book usually is I come up with an idea. I see something or I learn something or something that I, a theme that I want to write about. And then I start thinking about like what characters would best tell this story. Um, and I, and I think about the secondary characters and I sort of think about the the narrative arc, like we're starting here, I think we're going to end here. Here are some things that are going to happen along the way. I don't plot everything out. I'm not one of those people with the big storyboard and every chapter, you know, sort of written out. But I'm also not somebody who just gets up and starts writing a story. Um, I think a lot about names. Um, I really like to have the right name. Mm -hmm. um, what, is, what does it sound like? What's the meaning behind it? These are things that readers will never care about. They'll never know, you know, but it matters to me. But this, with this story, it just came to me fast. And so I sort of, and after a while, I had to sort of have, you know, a little sit down with myself and say, you know, you're way more interested in these other two than you are with the story that you're supposed to be writing. And so I gave that one up and I continued on, but I had to sort of backpedal to do all that thinking about what is the story about? And where are we going? And who are these two um, sort of as I was going along? So it was, um, it was a little scary, but it was really fun. I really enjoyed that. So a little, di a little different process for me this time. Well, throughout the story, Cass comes to a number of realizations about herself and her relationships with others. However, perhaps the most telling, I thought, was her observation, quote, that getting sober was the greatest risk of her life. What did you mean by that? I think making a major change is a big risk. You know, we, I think the human brain is, is sort of set to say, you know, the devil I know. You know, I know how to be in this, but to sort of chuck everything I know about how to operate in life, even if it's not really a good way to operate and try to um, find this um, new, this new way to be is, it can be terrifying. And, and Cass sort of describes it as what she calls the problem of normal. Like <laughs> what is normal? She, she, she never had normal. She doesn't know what normal is. And so she's sort of seeking this normal for herself and she has nowhere, she has no idea how to find it. And she, what she, she comes to realize is she's sort of building it herself for herself. And we all have to do that. We all have to figure out what's our normal, what's, what's gonna, what's gonna make our lives feel comfortable to us in a sense of not just not comfortable and sort of like easy, but make sense to us. You know, this is what makes sense for me in my life that I'm with this person. And these are the things that I engage, I spend my time doing. And these are the things I don't spend my time doing because those aren't good for me. You know, yeah, we I think all you mentioned in the book out. that, um, you know, she recognizes that alcoholics do a lot of lying. Alcoholics do a lot of forgetting, lack of observation. So maybe that was also very frightening for her that she had said that now see life as it was, not through this haze. Right. And she's, and she's sort of like, wow, there's a lot of stuff I didn't realize about what it's like to be sober. One of the things that I learned that I thought was so fascinating is that when somebody is consistently, you know, often regularly inebriated or under the influence of some, some substance, their maturation sort of goes on pause. They, they're, not, they're not able to sort of learn the life lessons that we learn as we grow, go old, get older because their brain is busy in this fog. Mm -hmm. And so Cass, when Cass sort of, you know, when alcohol is no longer a part of her, you know, brain, suddenly she realizes things that she sort of missed out on. The sort of normal, like, how do you, you know, getting a job or taking a class or learning to drive and even sort of interpersonal um, relationships. You know, how do I, how do I interact with people? Um, and so, you know, all of this is scary. 
I think I think when we when we decide to live a different way, it, even if it's a much better way, it's it's scary. I think. Well, turning this focus a little bit now over to Scott. You said he was a Red Sox third baseman. He's yeah. portrayed as a loner. He is yeah <clears throat> Ben's younger brother by eleven years. Cass makes the observation that there was a separateness about Scott. Cass wondered if she hadn't been willing to drink with Ben, if Scott would have gotten his brother back. What does this remark tell us about the brother's relationship and her role in each of their lives? And I can repeat that quote if you want. Well, I think Cass is, is realizing that she enabled Ben's drinking just as Ben enabled her drinking. The two of them drank together. And so, uh, and, she had, and she had tried to quit several times Ben wasn't terribly interested in quitting. So she didn't really get much support from him on it. But she starts to think as her eyes are opened and as she learns more about Scotty um, and sort of what the impact of Ben's drinking really was on him, she starts to think about, you know, what if I really had demanded that we figure out how to stop living in this really destructive way? And what if, and what if, Ben hadn't been so happy with me. If he hadn't had me, if he hadn't been happy, would he have been motivated to learn how to live a life without alcohol or with very little alcohol? And then Ben would have gotten, Scott would have sort of had his brother, his big brother whom he loved. Um, you know, I don't think that we can take, you know, full responsibility for other people and their their choices and but we all do, sometimes there's a domino effect of like, we've made this choice to, to do this thing and that affects, that affects this person. And then that affects somebody down the pike that we didn't really think about. Um, well, was, was, Scott in any, yeah, was, was, was Scott in any way jealous of his brother, Ben, because of Cass's involvement with Ben in Ben's life? You know, at one point he says to her, you know, I was jealous of you two because you had each other. She, he was jealous of them both, sort of like they had each other. And Ben, uh, Scott, whose who's, you know, defense mechanisms say, don't get too close to people. That's when you get let down. You know, he really didn't have anybody. And I think, you know, we all want to have that human connection. We all want to have somebody we can turn to, you know, talk to at the end of the day and, and or feel connected to, feel like I can be honest with you and I can trust you. And and Scott really didn't have that. He didn't have that in his brother because his brother was so unreliable. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that that Scotty wasn't in, in some way jealous of their relationship, that they they had each other. Well, you use uh, both cats and Scott use the word abyss to describe their situations. What did you intend to convey in using this word to portray their perceptions about themselves? You know, I think when life feels really hard, and we've probably all had that experience of feeling like this is too hard. What's happening right now in my life is insurmountable. And we feel like we're in abyss, whether it's from alcoholism or loneliness or, or you know, difficult, all kinds of possible difficulties in, in, our, in our lives. It can feel like we're in abyss. And I do think that they, they both felt in some ways that it was gonna be very hard abyss to climb out of. Um, and certainly it would have been if, if they were doing it completely alone. Um, and it was hard enough even with help. But I think, you know, it's, it's sort of a good analogy for how you feel when things feel just untenable. I'd like, I typically don't read from the book, but I want our audience to get a sense of how descriptive you are in your writing. And this is where you use this term abyss to describe Cass and how she regards her situation. The enormity of the task she had undertake, that she had taken on, having this baby alone with no money and no real job skills, fighting to stay sober every hour. It felt like cinder blocks on her shoulders. And it occurred to her in the abyss of that moment that it would be so much easier, so much simpler, if there was no baby, if there was no her. 
And I, I thought that that was just an example of how you convey to your reader what your characters are thinking and what they're feeling. So I just wanted to read that one excerpt. Thanks, Thank you Mary. for thinking that. Was, that. A, that's a nice one. Thank you for picking that. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, just as an aside, you don't appear to me, but maybe you are, to be a big baseball fan, but you seem to know a lot about baseball. So are you a fan or did you have to acquire this knowledge so that you can portray Scott as someone who's a baseball player? So I grew up in the Boston area, I, um, but my family wasn't a big baseball family. We just didn't, we weren't a sports family. So, you know, I go about my business, you know, I'd been to baseball games, but mostly as like, let's go and eat hot dogs. You know, it wasn't really about, you know, watching the game or knowing who was playing. Um, you know, I, I think I'd you know, been there with groups of friends or whatever. And then I married Tom Fay, and Tom Fay is a dyed in the wool Red Sox fan. And I joke that he came out of the womb with a cat, Red Sox cap on. Um, and he used to, he loved going to baseball games. He would, as a, as a young teen, he would take this, the train into the city by himself and, and go to the games by himself. Um, and he, you know, he loved baseball. And so I started going to games with him and became, I, I'd never, you know, say that I was nearly the fan that he is, but I started learning a lot about baseball and I, and I, you know, was sort of intrigued by it. And I also knew that when I made Scotty uh, third baseman for the Red Sox, that I would have in-house counsel about how to portray this guy. And it was great because my husband would read, he would read a section or, you know, there's a game in the book and he would say, well, the ball wouldn't go that way you know, or that's not it. And so it was really wonderful to have him. And that um, the year I was writing it, we spent a lot of time with family and we went to a lot of games. Um, I was able to find people to talk to who sort of were able to give me some inside stuff about what it's like. Um, one of the ushers told me all this great stuff about, you know, what happens when the guys get there and, and you know, what they do in training and all that stuff. And I also was able to find a flight attendant on the Red Sox away game flight. Oh. Um, and so she told me all kinds of, you know, like what they do and how they, you know, how they play cards and they drink and they, you know, um, and that loneliness is a real problem. Um, she would, she said, please don't put me in, in the acknowledgements. I don't want to lose my job. Um, <laughs> but it was, you know, so it was really, I, you know, I did a lot of research about alcoholism. I went to AA meetings and I read and I talked to people and all of that. But I also did a lot of research about being a baseball player, and that was really fun. Choosing the position third base, was that your choice, or did Tom tell you this guy be a well, third base guy? So I wanted Scott not to be a star. I wanted him not to be like a star pitcher or, a, you know, um, David Ortiz, you know, big slugger or anything like that. I wanted him to be sort of mid-level um, and that he was really struggling to sort of one of his problems that is he was sort of struggling to keep his spot on the team he was really good but he was not you know a star player and I thought third base is an important play you know it's, I mean they're all there's only nine positions they're all important but um that it would be an, an interesting place and also it was near the fans so uh -huh. that when um when Kath goes to a game she's pretty close you know she can oh, be yeah yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Well, typically I ask authors about their book titles uh, when we begin our conversation, but I thought I better to end this question uh, because you've, as you've discussed your novel, our audience, if they haven't read the book yet, has become familiar with it. You've given us a clue about the title's meaning near the end of the book. Now, the title of the book again is Catch Us When We Fall. And there are a lot of words in there that are very important. But in the end, towards the end of the book, you say, without revealing the essence of your story, what does the title Catch Us When We Fall mean? Would you like me to tell you my answer to that? Um, well, if, you, I, you if know, you're not going to spoil the book, that's why. No, I'm no, no, it won't spoil the book. No, no, no. And, okay. I, and I first I should start out by saying this book has had probably more titles than any of my books. I have gone <laughs> through so many titles with this book. And for a long time, the title was Dry Land that she's in search of dry land. There's a lot of sort of metaphors in there about how she's sort of in the, in the, you know, in a tiny boat in the middle of the sea and she's looking for dry land, dry also being not, you know, no alcohol. Right. Um, I thought dry land was a great title and my agent liked it and my editor liked it and that was gonna be the title. 
And then the sales team got it and they said, it's too dry. And, you know, it is a little, you know, it doesn't, it's not so descriptive if you don't know what the story is about. So we were told to go back to the drawing board. And so I can't, I, I spent a lot of, <laughs> I spent a ridiculous amount of time uh, uh, searching up songs, poems, you know, all kinds of literature that had to do with alcoholism, baseball, babies, anything I could think of, and sort of pulling words together and mixing and matching words. And I came up with catch as in, you know, sort of baseball catch. And also, you know, when, when, when we're in free fall, we want somebody to sort of break our fall to catch us. Um, and the fall was also like falling off the wagon. And so the title that I came up with was Catch Me If I Fall. And then I talked to a group of author friends of mine and we sort of workshopped it a little bit. And they said, it should be catch us because we all need that sometimes. It's not just one person in the book who needs to be caught. And then catch us when, not if, because we're all going to need that at some point. We're all going to fall. Um, so by the time we got to catch us when we fall, I was pretty pleased. And so that became, the, and, and so was everybody else. Thank goodness. It's a good so, time. I like it. Yes. Yeah. Thank I you. Like it. I like it. Um, before we go to qu any questions we may have from the audience, I'm curious, what's next on your agenda? I mean, authors always have ideas in their heads, starting one project, stopping one, and you mentioned you had done this in the course of writing this book. So can we expect another novel from you? As a matter of fact, you can. Um, I uh, sold, I wrote a book last year, um, in sort of in the depth of the pandemic because you know we were sort of trapped at home and sold it my same editors is uh purchased it um and in fact i just talked to her this morning about edits and we have just you know determined what you know sort of little fixes need to happen uh, which is a normal process that writers go through with their editors it will likely come out um, in a probably winter 2023 is what they're talking about. So probably January or February, about 16 months from now. Um, and it is a story about a, um, one of the things that really hit me during the pandemic was how people were sort of taking this opportunity of not being able to go anywhere, not like, you know, not, not people's lives slowed, so slowed down in a lot of ways. And that some people were taking this opportunity to kind of re review and, and look at their lives and say, you know, is this where I wanted to end up? Is this the person I should be with? Is this the job I should have? Is this the industry I want? You know, is this, is this the city I want to live in? You know, and I think in some ways people felt like, hey, life is short. Like I, I need to, if I want to make some changes, now's the time. So I, I came up with this idea about a woman in her 50s who's reviewing her life, looking back and realizing that she really has a lot of regrets, that her life really kind of went sideways. Um, and she, and she, in thinking about it, she realizes that um, things started to go awry in high school 40 years ago mm -hmm. when she, um, she spent the night in the woods, a night in the woods with a boy she loved, who, who loved her. And the next thing, the next day, everything fell apart. And as a result of that, little by little, she made decisions that sort of sent her sideways a little bit. So she's thinking about this and she's sitting in the woods um, and she, a little boy runs by, he's three years old. This is like page one, so I'm not yeah. spoiling anything. About three, runs past her alone in the woods and he looks up at her and trips over a, a branch and smacks down into it and she goes over to pick him up and, you know, where's your grown up? And he said, I was playing a trick on my grandpa. I, I run away. I run away. And um, she, the, the grandfather comes running through the woods to find the kid and it's the guy from high school oh. and they haven't seen each other in 40 years and Helen really wants to just like oh it's water under the bridge I don't want to think about this I don't want to deal with this but he says we need to talk and that's the premise of the story well interesting well we'll look forward to that I'm not going to ask you for a title yet because maybe there's just one you're thinking about so we'll be looking forward to receiving it uh, Amanda, are there any uh, questions in the chat room for Juliet? 
At the moment, there aren't any questions. Um, we certainly, as always, encourage anyone attending to send um, questions through the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, or if you'd like to send anything through the chat, um, please feel free to do so. Do um, have... Ask questions about anything. You can ask questions about you know, what it's like to be a writer or publishing or any, anything you want. If I don't know the answer, I will make something up because that's my job. <laughs> You are a fiction writer, after all. <laughs> I will, yes, yeah, exactly right. Well, we have a, an opportunity tonight, uh, Juliet, to introduce to you someone from the library, a volunteer. And we thought we want to introduce her to our audience tonight as a resource for different people. This is Susan Rosen, R-O-S-E-N. Mm -hmm. She is a library volunteer community resource advocate. And Susan, if you could briefly describe your role at the library and what resources that you have available to you, I think that would be very helpful. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, Juliet, something that you said triggered exactly what I'm doing. You said um, in, in the community is where we find help when we're falling or when we have problems and, um, you know, alcohol and drug abuse is a huge problem in our community, just like any other community. Mm -hmm. um, one of the issues that we have in our community is we don't have like a social service department. We don't have someplace where somebody can go and find out where to get information. So working together with the library, I have years of working in the human service field before I retired. Um, I volunteer a half a day a week to be the resource advocate. So if there's anyone who is struggling with any kind of questions or um, needs some kind of help, they just don't know where to turn. And you know, I think you kind of made a lot of those points when you were talking about your book. People, they feel alone, they don't know where to go, they might not have anyone they can turn to. Um, people can email me because right now we're not in the, I'm not in the library because of COVID. Um, and I'll give you, give out my uh, library email. I will find resources in the community where people can go and find some help. Um, if I don't know of them myself, I will research until I find them. So it's, you know, people don't have to worry about any kind of confidentiality or anything. They send me an email, a little blurb about, you know, what kind of help they're looking for, what they're dealing with. Um, my email is, um, advocate at westerlylibrary.org. So what a wonderful resource, Susan. Uh, uh, the the community is very lucky to have you. Thank you. It's funny, you know, I saw an article um, on TV that a lot of libraries in the country are dealing with a lot of the issues that, you know, are in your book. People show up in libraries. Libraries yeah. are warm. Yeah. Libraries are comforting. There's a lot going on. That's right. Um, so the library is like a perfect place to provide that kind of a service. Sure is. But I love the way you, I feel like you know your characters, like you're friends with them. And I was fascinated, it got me distracted because I was so fascinated by the way you talk. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Susan. I think our okay. audience certainly okay. appreciates that. Uh, particularly if they know of someone who might need help in finding resources and that you're available to them. Thank you so much. We appreciate that and the library providing this service to our community. Uh, if there are no further questions, I think I do see one. Am I correct, Amanda? There is, yeah. Um, someone has asked, well, someone has uh, mentioned that it's uh, great to see you, Juliet, and hear from you. Um, they've read all of your books and love them. Can't wow. wait for the next one. Who are your favorite authors and what do you like to read? Oh my gosh. So it's really hard to pick favorite authors. I feel like that, you know, it's like they're changing all the time. Um, I can tell you some books that I've read recently that I really enjoyed. Um, so I'm a big audiobook reader, uh, listener. Um, I, I like to multitask. So I like to listen to books while I drive, not doing that much driving these days, but um, I, I'm a big gardener. So I'll listen to a book as I'm pulling weeds or I'm planting things or whatever. Um, I listened to the audiobook of The Kindest Lie by Nancy Johnson. And it's about a, a woman in her 30s. She's a very successful black engineer. And she's come from this very sort of hard scrabble town. 
and she has to go back there to sort of sort out some things from her past. Um, and when she comes back there, you know, there's, there's some racial tension, there's some, there's some class tension. Um, it's a, it's a fascinating story. It's a real page turner or the, I didn't, it's a ear, whatever. Um, and I really enjoyed it. It's a very compassionate book. Was, I, I really loved the way Nancy Johnson sort of built all of her characters. Um, and the narrator is fantastic. So I will, I will give a plug for that book. Another book that I read recently that I really enjoyed was The Sweeney Sisters by Leon Dolan. And it's about three sisters. Um, their, their dad, who's a famous writer, um, dies. And they find out things after his death that they never knew. And they have to sort of sort that out. Um, and it's um, very entertaining, but also written, just really well written. Again, I loved the narrator. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna recommend those two. Well, thank you very much. We all have our favorite books, but it's sometimes hard to remember them. Um, and so there's so many of them. Well, thank you so much, Juliet, for joining us. Amanda, do you think we should bring this to a close now? Yeah, um, I, I just, we had someone else, Peg had commented, thank you, Juliet, for your honesty, which sincerely opens up a platform to help people realize that they are not alone. That's very nice, thank you. That is nice. Um, one last question for you, Amanda. Is the book available for purchase at the Savoy Bookstore yet? I just put um, a drop link in the chat for everyone. Um, anyone that doesn't have a copy already and is interested in a signed copy, um, there are copies available at the Savoy Bookshop. Just uh, please make sure to mention our library, um, but I also sent a link that you can click on. Well, that's great. Thank you. And I, I would highly recommend this. Well, thank you so much again, Juliet, for spending at this time with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Mary. I really appreciated you. You had some wonderful questions that I hadn't heard before. So that's always <laughs> fun. Okay. Thank you Thanks very much. Thanks so much to the both of you. Uh, thank you for taking the time, Juliet. Uh, this was wonderful. And thank you as always to Mary. Um, Good night. Have a great night, everyone. Good night.